Okay, quick briefer on acoustics now. Uh, hopefully we can get this done in 10 minutes, probably not. Okay, most of the sound we hear happens in spaces. Uh, in the old days, maybe we were out in the desert or something like that. We had trees around or maybe a cave. But for now, many of the sounds we hear are in rooms and buildings. And what happens to sound in those spaces is called acoustics. Okay? Well, if you have a waveform happening from a sound and going like this, everybody's happy in the free field. Okay? Free field means there is no acoustic space around. Free field. Okay? But then some Yahoo puts a wall there. Okay? And that sound hits that wall, what does it do? It's got to bounce back. Okay? These waves, of course, interact with each other. And just like you take a bucket of water and shake it around, things start shaking around in there a lot, especially when you have all these different frequencies happening in all these different waves. The study of what happens there is acoustics. Okay? When we were listening to the, the wind ensemble there, there was a lot of energy in that, in that space, right? It's a big space, but that was a lot of energy coming out of those things, right? Uh, it was pushing what that room could handle. It was pushing what that room could handle because it was like taking and shaking up that water too much didn't have nice flows to it. It was like starting to, to wiggle and jiggle in wrong ways. The biggest, simplest thing that happens in acoustic when things start going wrong is you start to have a wave that starts to have a mathematical relationship with the room. And when this wave bounces back, hits this wall and comes back this way, hits this wall and goes back that way, what happens when I put those two waves together? Phase cancellation, exactly. Now what happens if that wave, if I had bounced that wave just a little bit earlier, let's say it's a little bit smaller here, and I had gone, so I can do this. Oh, it's a bigger wave, let's do this. Oh dear. And what happens when that wave bounces back? Oh dear. And what do I end up with? Twice as much. These are called standing waves. Low frequencies uh, have uh, a wave that will line up often with the room and cause these standing waves, which causes nodes and antinodes in the room. Points where there's way more pressure than there should be, and points where there's no pressure where there shouldn't be. And it makes the room sound like mud. These are the bane of most acousticians right here. Okay, low frequency information, standing waves. Okay. High frequencies will do things like this. It'll come off, they go pling, pling, like this, pling, 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 pling. It hits this side and it bounces back. Pling, 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 pling. And these things keep going back and forth. You can hear them when you're walking down hallways and you go like this, or it's called a flutter echo. And a flutter echo is when the sound just bounces back and forth like this at a high frequency. Little high, short, percussive sounds will bounce back and forth. Standing waves, flutter echoes. Standing waves are low, flutter echoes are high. Both are a pain. They're what you want to avoid. These standing waves can happen between floor and ceiling. That's where they happen the most. Front and back walls, side walls. Rooms that have parallel walls are susceptible to it. That's why some studios will have rooms that are not parallel, or walls that are not parallel. A lot of stages and, and uh, stuff will be angled, right? Uh, it's why there's this false ceiling tile up here above, is to as avoid the standing waves and flutter echoes that would be happening between the floor and the ceiling right here. Okay. The ceiling does a really good job of absorbing that. Yes? So, so carpet would be good for absorption? Car okay, so let's, we're about to get to absorption. Carpet is uh, okay for certain things. Uh, hang on here, I think. One of the ways to, th um, oh, I'm sorry, let me t check on, t touch on reverb here. So reverb is all the reflected signal in the room, all the echoes, not just these standing and reflect, reflect, or flutter echoes. There's lots of other waves coming through here. There's this guy here that comes back and they're pretty happy. It doesn't have much problem. There's the one that went up to this wall bounced off here and came back, right? There's all sorts of echoes going on into a room. 
And when all those echoes to come together, or all those delays come together, they, it makes a reverb. Okay? It's a reverber reverberation. The time is, how long does it take for it to die out in the room? That depends on the absorption and the size of the room. And the field is, how far away do you have to be from that person or the, the source where the, the echoed sound is more than the source was? Okay, I think I've talked about that a few times here. Andrew is a couple feet in front of me. He mainly hears my voice. Fernando's in the very back. Fernando mainly hears the echoing happening in the room and then my voice. And his brain is retroactively assigning the sound to my mouth, coming out of my mouth. But really his brain is doing a lot of filtering on the room. If we set up a mic back there, the mic would mainly hear the room. And if you played back that microphone, you'd hear those echoes. Okay? Reverb. That's called the reverberant field. Okay? I'm too far away from the source. When I was setting up those mics in, uh, in the, the recording and the wind ensemble, those, the ribbon mics were very much had a lot of direct sound. Those Neumanns were starting to back into the river field, where we were starting to listen to the room more than we were the instruments. All right, so what do we, want to, what do, we do about standing waves and flutter echoes? Those are our main problems. Okay, or any other sort of acoustic phenomenon that we don't want to have happen. Well, the first thing we need to do is understand that uh, <coughs> it depends on the wavelength. And this is what no one, no, many people do not talk about. Which frequencies have longer wavelengths? Lower frequencies. Okay. In order to absorb a sound, basically your absorptive material needs to be about as thick, about as, thick as the wavelength is long. As thick as the wavelength is long. Well, that's easy. We just need to figure out what the wavelength is and uh, get some materials that thick. Okay, so let's start out. I can tell you this. One thing you want to know. One, 1,000 hertz. 1K is about one foot. So if I want to absorb all sounds at one foot, at 1K, how thick does my material need to be? Hmm, interesting. Okay. Uh, how about 500 hertz? How thick would that be? Other, other direction. Because remember, the low frequencies are longer, right? <laughs> wavelength and frequency are inversely related. As wavelength goes up, frequency goes down. Right? As frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. Okay? How about 200, 250 hertz? Half as long again. Is this making sense? I use this uh, regularly. I would say on a monthly basis, I am doing this calculation right here in my head. I do it just like this every time. You would think by now I would have these sort of memorized. 125 hertz, the wave is 8 feet long. If you have a room that's 8 feet long and this is 125 hertz, it's going to fit in the room perfectly and make a beautiful, horrible sounding standing wave. Okay. 62.5 hertz. 31 hertz. Yeah. That's long. You need some seriously absorptive material to suck that bad boy up, don't you? Ain't going to happen. So what can you do with bass frequencies? Nothing. You let him out of the room, which, of course, upsets the neighbor. So it's a neighbor, and we'll have to talk about isolation in a second. So what I'd like you to have, your first thing when you're thinking of is absorption and isolation. What is the difference? Absorption means I'm not letting the sound uh, echo in the room. Isolation means I'm not letting the sound go into the next room. And they are uh, um, at war with each other. Because the best way to keep my room sounding good and not having standing waves and flutter echoes is to let the sound pass out of it. The best way to keep the sound from going in the other room is to keep all the sound in mind, right? They, you can't do both. You can't do both. There's always a battle between them. Okay? So generally what we try to do is keep some isolation, keep some of the sound in to keep our neighbors from getting mad, and then try to absorb as much as we can. But we have to know you can't absorb those low frequencies. The ways that you can absorb that low frequency is you can, or what you can do with that low frequency is try to avoid standing waves as much as possible. Make the space as big as possible because every doubling of the distance, the sound goes one quarter as loud. 
if this red line were coming back and it was only this loud, it's not near as much phase cancellation. So if that room is 32, 40 feet long, by the time that bass frequency is coming back to me, it's still a quarter as loud, right? Much quieter. Uh, so room size is really important. The shape of the walls so that you don't have parallel surfaces is really important. Okay. And then finally, we'll get to absorption. Okay. So there are three main types of absor absorption. Uh, ultimately, they're all frictional, but the, we call the top one frictional. Frictional absorption means uh, high frequencies can be absorbed by it. When I hold up this nasty towel here and I put my mouth in front of it, you'll hear the high frequencies disappear. Not totally disappear, but they're reduced. I can actually hear them reflecting back at me. Some of them. But most of them are going into this towel, getting to know the towel well, heating up. They have a, a nice relationship. They get all warm and toasty in there. And the, the sound waves are converted to heat in the towel. Okay. That is called frictional absorption. It works only for high frequencies. So when people put up uh, drapes or carpet, uh, they are doing a good job of absorbing some of the high frequencies. And we're talking high frequencies, we're talking things above 5K. The thicker it is, the higher it goes, right? So if, you're, if your drapes are this thick or your carpet is this thick, it's going to get down to maybe 2K or something like that, 2,000. Okay, start absorbing that. So what does carpet do in a room? It makes it sound muffled. Does it do anything for the standing waves? No. Will it kill some of the flutter echoes of the high frequency? Yes, depending how thick it is. Okay. Many people walk in a room in the hill carpet and they go, ah, that's better. These people are not musicians or audio engineers. An audio engineer will walk in a room and go, God, this sounds like mud. Okay. We have some rooms here on campus. I'm recording right now, I won't talk about, uh, where there is a lot of high frequency absorption but the mid and low is still very, very rumbly. The f yeah, I don't, I don't even say which room right now. Okay. Soundproof foam that you purchase or they sell you is a frictional absorber absorbing the high frequency sound. Exactly. And if that's what you want, do it. And you need that sometimes. You need that sometimes, right? You need that sometimes. When we go over to the band, we're going to hear all these right here. Okay. Flexural. If you need to get rid of Mid frequencies, flexural absorption is your friend. Flexural absorbers, uh, when the sound hits them, they bend a little bit. They give. The sound comes in here and hits this, it gives a little bit. Uh, anything that thumps, like a window, or like this piece of wood, or the wall, right there. There's a little flex in that. And when the sound wave hits it, it gives. To get rid of mid frequencies, we're talking from, I don't know, 300, 200, up to 1K, you need a flexural absorber. And when we go into the band room, you'll see that there's flexural absorbers all over on the walls. I'll show you. Oh, here, you can have it. Ready? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to see if there's a picture of some flexural absorbers, which there are none. But they look something like that. Actually, this is a pretty good picture. Okay. So frictional things go in it and get turn, converted to heat. Flexural, it gives a little bit. And you'll see that when you go to the band room, there's going to be these big uh, uh, flexing bowed pieces of wood. Okay. The last attempt to get rid of bass frequencies is if you have very specific bass frequencies, uh, make sure to check online for the assignments too. Okay. Uh, very specific bass frequencies that you want to get rid of. You can create a resonant chamber and a resonant absorber often looks like a box in the corner where that box is tuned to the specific frequency in the room that would be a standing wave. And you would try to get rid of just that wave or the, the, the waves around it. Okay. If we can get rid of this standing wave here and absorb it out of the room, we have some, we can, we can do that with the resonant absorber, sort of. But really, there's very little way to keep uh, big standing waves from happening in a room. Well, the two ways are the size of the room and the shape of the room. The bigger the room, the less square the walls, the more, the less standing waves you have. Say there's a machine at the top. 
it, a resonant absorber would be a tuned box. No one ever uses them because, like I said, it, it can only do like one frequency, really. So what about the next level up? You know, when I doubled that frequency, I've got another standing wave, twice as high, right? Coming back. Yeah. Very hard. And uh, so the, the guy that we're working with right now to do the, the studio here is really pleased with our studio because of the size of it. It's like, I don't have to do much with this one. By the time the standing wave hits that wall and comes back, it's so low, it's hardly canceling anything out. So size is your friend there. Or you let the sound go through. I used to have a boat, and that was a great listening place because the fiberglass boat, uh, the wa sound waves just go right through it into the water. <laughs> the, the low frequency. Like MTV Unplugged, but you actually most of our big out open spaces, like all the recording. When it's like acoustic recording, uh, acoustic, acoustic music does not have a lot of low end, so no, that's probably just so they could have the audience there and look, look like it's a stage. Uh, anywhere you have that bass going, though. That's why festivals sound better outside, because you don't have to, I mean, that would really sound bad having those indoors be like, boom, as there's all these standing waves. So. Okay, so those are the three kind of absorbers that I'd like you to know. If you cannot control, well, actually we did talk about it a little bit. If you can change the angle of a wall, that waveform doesn't bounce straight back. It bounces off to the side. And we don't get those standing waves as much. That's called diffusion. Diffusion means uh, less direct reflection. The sound bounces around in the room. And there are things called diffusers out there. They look like this. that have varied surfaces on them that bounce different sounds back at different times. And that would be like having my wall now have little points forward and little points back on it. So that when the sound hits it, it's bouncing, some of it's bouncing back earlier and some of it's bouncing back later and you don't get those standing waves. You also don't get the flutter echoes because they'll bounce back at different times. It's disrupting the surface of the wall. It is the exact same thing as when you look at the, you can come on in here. It's the exact same thing as when you look at these Apple computers and you see the shiny Apple and you see the silver gray. The silver gray is diffuse. The shiny Apple is, is not diffuse. It's direct. It's du the shiny Apple is reflecting the light rays directly back the way they came in. The gray uh, matte finish is bouncing those particles in all directions so they're not aligned when they come back. They don't look like the real world when they come back. Diffuse. The quietest room in the world have a lot of absorbers. So these are diffusers. And uh, what is the Anacoya changer? Do you not know how to spell it? Simpler than I thought. Anacoya chamber will have a combination of, uh, you see that these are combination diffuser and uh, absorbers. They have a very porous surface on them, but any big frequencies that hit them and bounce off are going to bounce off at an angle and never get back to the listener. Yeah. And these are huge. Remember I was saying they have to be like, I don't remember the exact ratio, but related to the wavelength. The wavelength's very long. The diffuser or the absorber needs to be very long. These are probably 10 feet long, 8 feet long. The walls are not parallel in here. I guarantee you that. So that's an anechoic chamber. No echoes. You do not want that. This sounds very unnatural in a recording. You want a diffuse sound. Same way we like, like light. You ever been under a really harsh light? That's, called, that's direct light. It's not diffuse. This light in this room is reflecting off the ceiling here. It's bouncing around, giving us a warmer, more pleasing light. If we had naked light bulbs in here, or if I put my face in front of this projector, it's a fairly unpleasant <laughs> experience, right? That light is coming directly into my eyes. Yeah, it's exactly. Hard light versus soft light. This is soft sound, uh, and these naked walls with cheat rock on them are going to give you a hard sound. Okay? So diffusion is where we want to soften the sound. The last thing, isolation. How do we keep our neighbors happy? These absorbing materials do not keep your neighbors happy. They have nothing to do with the sound that's leaving the room. In fact, these only have to do with the sound that's staying in the room. Okay. So if you are absorbing sound in a room, 
it's not getting to your neighbors, <laughs> right? It wasn't getting to your neighbors in the first place, right? Does this make sense? I have a wall there. A sound's going in. It's doing one of two things. It's either bouncing back to me or going through the wall or some combination thereof. So if it is bouncing back to me and I start absorbing it where I am, it makes no difference to the person on their side. The only part they heard was the part going through the wall in the first place. Does this make sense? This is an important distinction. Putting up egg crates and carpet in your room does nothing for helping your neighbor. It will reduce, generally, the high frequency information in your space, while the low frequency information continues to go right through them like they're not even there. They're too thin. They're too thin. So okay. it helps for maybe guitars, but not like kicks? Yeah, kick or bass or any, anything low, or low, low parts of the guitar will go right through too. It helps for things you don't really need much help with. Anyway. Exactly. It helps for things you don't need that much help with anyway. And in fact, on those high frequencies, rather than absorbing the heck out of them, what you'd rather do is diffuse them so you do have more of a pleasing sound by adding these diffusers and making your walls not parallel. My, my, I have a great listening uh, space in the back of my house. It's all glass windows on the back wall. Uh, it's big. It's what, like 20 by 30 feet. It's got wood paneling. It's old funky porch they covered in. At an angle like this, it's got hard concrete walls that are different levels with windows in them. So there's no, nothing really parallel in there. Any of the base just goes right out the windows like it's not even there. And the relationship between the floor and the ceiling is not parallel either. And it's got a wood surface which has some uh, diffusion characteristics in it. Yeah. When I play my drums loud, my neighbors know it. <laughs> right? If I didn't want my neighbors to do it, well, what I have to say then is I need to reflect the sound back into the room. How do I do that? Mass. The heavier the material, the more it bounces back in. So we think concrete. And we think wavelength. And we think, hmm, if I need to stop a 32-foot wave, I just need, maybe it's about half of that, I need about a 15-foot wall. 15-foot thick wall. A room within a room. What's that? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to get to that in just a second. So 32 foot thick wall to stop bass from getting my neighbors might not be, or 15 foot thick wall, might not be that realistic, right? Might not be that realistic. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the most realistic thing is don't put a big subwoofer and play music loud where I don't want my neighbor to hear it. My best thing is inverse square law, right? The further I get away, Every, t every doubling of the distance, that sound's going to be a quarter as loud. Let me move away. Let me move away. Let me move away. Okay. Uh, if, is there any hope for us? Well, the only hope is that there are these double wall partitions. Okay? And what these will do is provide some of that resonant absorption by capturing some of the sound in between and mimic a much thicker wall. And in fact, you can use a double studded or double roomed wall and mimic up to a 10 to 12 foot thick concrete wall. If you wanted. And I think I have... Uh, that, I think I have a drawing of that here. Yeah. Okay, so the way that a, 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 a double partition wall works is that it, uh, you'd have uh, some uh, sheetrock on one side, sheetrock on the other, and you'd have your studs like this so that this stud is not touching this wall. Because right now when you have a wall with one stud going in between, like this, is the base will go just right through that stud and pop out the other side. It's too firm. By having this be separate, you, fill, you can fill this with some insulation in the base. Some of it will reflect, some will pop through, and then some will reflect again, and some will pop through. But this part that reflect will get absorbed in here, absorbed in here. And you actually start to have a resonance in here too, so you get some of that resonance absorption. I'm trying to show a good picture of that, but I don't, I don't see it. So the only way to really stop base is to have these double partitioned walls. Uh, and the biggest issue is you can't have an end to it. You can't have the wall end here because guess what the base note frequencies are loo? They just go, they're so big, they just go right around it. 
So sometimes people will put in this double partition wall, and then they'll have the ceiling be just a, 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 a ceiling tile like this, and the sound just goes right up over the wall and around it. Remember, think of these base waves as big waves, like in the ocean. So you put a little, uh, a, a little wall up in the ocean, what's the big waves going to do? Right around it, like it's not even there. It's the same thing in sound. Okay? If you have a, a big wave going to that wall, and you've got a really great partition wall, but you have a crack under the door, and it was the ocean, what would happen? The pressure from that wave would push through under there, and the water on the other side would go up. Not as fast. It would slow down, but it would still go up. That water pressure is going to push through those little cracks. The air pressure will do the same thing with the big waves. Okay? Big waves. The little, little tiny waves around the top would hit that wall, bounce back, and they stop. Okay? So when it comes to isolation, uh, your biggest friend is distance, <laughs> inverse square law. Get away from it. Your second one is basically you're stuck with these double partition walls. Carpet, frictional absorbers, flexural absorbers are not going to do anything because those frequencies are easy to cut out anyway. Plus, we know that those frequencies are short wavelength. They don't go that far. So the problems you can fix are the ones that aren't important, as Doug so nicely put it. Okay. The ones you can, again, summarize what you can fix. You can have non-parallel walls. You can have diffusers on those walls. Okay. And you have distance. Either the room is really big or the distance from the other person is big. And lastly, you can put up double-studded walls, but they better be everywhere. Around all four walls, ceiling, and the door, the and no windows. Floor well, fortunately, the floors, if it's on the earth, you're probably OK. But if you're in a building, you're upstairs, yeah, you're in trouble. OK? Questions? It's the most misunderstood area of audio, probably, that I've experienced.